Okay, so there's Lord of the Flies, Chapter 12, Cry of the Hunters. So what you want to annotate on the first page is this bit here in the blue. His wounds, the bruised flesh, was inches in diameter over his right ribs with a swollen and bloody scar where the spear had hit him. His hair was full of dirt and tapped like the tendrils of a creeper. So we've got a little simile in there. All over he was scratched and bruised from his flight through the forest. So we've got... We've highlighted this for weakness, and he's talking about how Ralph is kind of tainted, impure, cut, he's bleeding, he's sort of, he's delusional, he's kind of under threat, he's under stress, he's under duress, he's not in his normal clear thinking state, as we learned in chapter 11 as well. So he represents civilization and all those sorts of ideas, but he's kind of being brought to a less civilized state is what we're trying to show here. Down here we've got, he had even glimpsed one of them strip, striped down, it should probably say strip, stripped, but it says striped, striped brown, black and red, I apologise, it should be striped, so they've got tribal paint all over them, which is a little symbol just around this chapter, and had judged that it was Bill, but really thought Ralph, this was not Bill, this was a savage whose image refused to blend with that ancient picture of a boy in shorts and shirt. So we're going to highlight that for something like corruption and it's basically saying that Bill was once just a boy in shorts but now he is basically a savage and you can take a more colonialist reading of this one that's not how you spell colonialist a colonialist reading because it's saying that you know when he was a white pale schoolboy he was superior to what he is now in you know all the obvious connotations there Jumping across, nothing on 226, but at the bottom of 227 we've got, uh, this is where we come face to face with the, the pig, which was for a moment the beast, but which is no longer. And it says, the white face was bone, and that the pig skulls grinned at him from the top of a stick. He walked slowly into the middle of the clearing and looked steadily at the skull that gleamed as white as ever as the conch had done, and seemed to jeer at him cynically, so that's pretty clear cut. The conch used to represent democracy, justice, all that sort of thing. And now, and then for a brief moment, sort of the beast was the clear alternative to democracy, I guess. Um, and now it just jeers at him cynically. So sort of democracy has been defeated and the beast has also been not so much defeated, but overruled, overcome. And so now the question would be what's left? And Ralph also represents sort of the last remnants of this kind of civilization, I guess. So we've, I've highlighted this for cruelty, and it's very a very useful quote because you can talk about the death of democracy, the emergence of the beast briefly, and then finally we're at sort of the third stage, which is kind of question mark, question mark, question mark, not really sure what's left anymore. Jumping ahead, so we've got a couple. He stood the skull about on a level with his face. Uh, the skull regarded Ralph like one who knows all the answers and won't tell. So that's a simile used by Golding there. But it's telling us that the, he still feels that the skull, or the beast rather, contained some element of truth or reality to it. Um, and here also the line which highlighted underlined above was the skull about on a level with his face so sort of he and the beast uh, like if this was a film you'd say you know they're at eye level they're in the shot together they're sort of equal and related and so obviously he's started to realize that maybe the beast was something internal within him we're going to jump down to here uh, he felt among the shadows and felt his isolation bitterly they were savages, it was true, but they were human, and the ambushing fears of the deep night were coming on. So this is both fear, savagery, <clears throat> and also a childish fear of the night of darkness, like when they were still innocent kill children. <coughs> then on 229, kill the beast, cut his throat, spill his blood, is an example of tribalism, and it's sort of, kind of their catch cry at this point. So this is Jack's tribe, basically now they're hunting Ralph, whereas before they were hunting the beast. So he's the new thing now. 
through 30, just down the bottom, memory of their new and shameful loyalty came to them. Eric was silent, but Sam tried to do his duty. So Ralph has appeared basically out the front of Jack's camp. And Sam and Eric represent kind of the devil and the angel on someone's shoulder. And so them having problems at this point is kind of indicative of the way that they've sort of moved away from civilization, who stands before them in the form of Ralph. Then bottom of 231, when Ralph spoke again, his voice was low and seemed breathless. What have I done? I liked him. I wanted us to be rescued. So this is the last kind of ditch attempt at rescue. <clears throat> and he's trying to apologize for what he's done. Then 2.32, he could not bring himself to be specific at first, but then fear and loneliness goaded him. So he's starting to feel that he's all alone, everyone else is part of Jack's tribe or elsewhere, and so he's sort of on his own. <clears throat> 2.33, you've got to go now, Ralph, for your own good. Keep away as far as you can. So Sam and Eric are consumed by fear of Jack, the tribe, and sort of the evil, I guess, that they've begun to practice. And so this shows, seems to suggest to me anyway, that Sam and Eric aren't actually evil, but that they are being kind of ruled or controlled, which might be a comment on your sort of typical Hitler, Nazism, fascism type comment. So it's saying basically that the people that were part of the Nazi party were not themselves evil, but they were driven by their fear of the powerful, fearful, dangerous leader, I guess. Or of course you could interpret it in a lot of different ways, but I would note that this is an ideal little section to talk about a political reading of the text. 234, this is becomes a very important little symbol. Uh, so all throughout we've talked about spears and how they're dangerous and they represent kind of killing, violence, masculine issues, all that sort of stuff. Um, but this is the first time that we see a, sh a stick sharpened at both ends. So that's clearly a weapon. You could never, there's no, nothing really useful hunting wise that you would use for a double edged spear except to fight, fight with people. So this becomes an important motif that represents sort of perhaps even moving into war. So before they were surviving, now that they're actually hunting humans, they go get a double edged spear. Three, 235, while he was eating, he heard fresh noises, cries of pain from Sam and Eric, cries of panic, angry voices. What did it mean? Someone beside him was in trouble, for at least for at least one of the twins was catching it. Then the voices passed away down the rock, and he ceased to think of them. So basically, Roger's hiding in a bush, <coughs> or a thicket, or something that's described like that, and the twins, Sam and Eric, are being asked to sort of rat out his hiding position, which of course, again relates to our Nazism theme or idea, fascism, political reading, all of that. Um, so you're thinking in this situation he is the Jew hiding under the whatever stairs perhaps or in the roof or something. He's hidden and the Nazi party is calling for these normal citizens which is what Sam and Eric almost always represent as well as kind of a conscience for the group I guess. And so they're being punished, one of them is anyway at least. So as it says, uh, one of the twins was catching it, which means he's being beaten or hit or something. So presumably Jack or some other member of the tribe is beating up one of the twins. Uh, and they are kind of not ratting out where Ralph is at this point. Then we'll jump ahead, nothing too much really quotable there. And then 2.39, uh, his spear twisted a little in his hands and then he withdrew it again. Uh, so what's happening here is Ralph thrusts his own stick through the crack and struck with all his might. So he's just kind of indiscriminately stabbing in the dark and then his spear twisted a little in his hands and then he withdrew it again. And then again there's a similar ooing, ahhing, onomatopoeia sound. Onomatopoeia. Uh, and then see, I told you he's dangerous. The wounded savage moaned again. So they're talking, they're hunting for Ralph. <coughs> Someone's been stabbed. And so this kind of confirms their fears that Ralph is indeed dangerous because he's stabbing, stabbing at them. Jumping ahead, uh, I've got a little piggy, pig drawn here. But I'm not really sure why, so we'll leave that there. Uh, so this is one of the last little acts of civilization. We've got repetition of think, which is something they are now struggling to do because pig is 
deceased. So without him, they kind of lack the ability to think or critically think or to think for themselves or something like that. And then in the middle, <coughs> what was the sensible thing to do? There was no piggy to talk sense. There was no solemn assembly for debate, nor dignity of the conch. So science is dead. Earlier, what did we talk about? What was the options that were crossed off? So right back at the start, we had democracy is no longer an option, the beast is no longer an option, and we were looking for the third possibility. So if we jump back to where we were, which is 2.41, sorry. Uh, so there's no debate, and there's no piggy, and as we know, piggy represents intellect and all those sort of things. So intellect is gone, debate is gone, and democracy is gone, as we said earlier as is the beast. So they're all gone. So the question on all of this, the young people's minds is, sorry, that couldn't actually be seen. The question is what's left. So intellect's gone, debate's gone, democracy's gone, beast is gone. So now we're up to five. What is the fifth option? What is the other alternative? Nothing much, 242, 243, 244. He saw that the stick was sharpened at both ends. So again, that's our little symbol of violence taking place. 246, it was a white topped cap and above the green shape of the peak was a crown and anchor gold gold foliage. So this is kind of your classic sailor's hat with the little gold foliage on the side. He saw white drill, epaulettes, a revolver and a row of gilt buttons down the front of a uniform. So this is them being rescued. Uh, so this is very suitable for a colonialist reading. They are the savages, they are the problem and they are being saved by in this case, the great white hope who comes bearing all the sort of accoutrements of civilization. He's got the buttons, he's got the hat, he's got everything. Uh, I think it even mentions that he has a gun later on in the piece. Uh, and then the officer says, fun and games. So he's referring to the outside world and kind of bringing his understanding of the world to their little place. And then top here, the fire reached the coconut palms by the beach and swallowed them noisily. A flame seemingly detached, swung like an acrobat and licked up the palm, licked up, licked up the palm heads on the platform. So that's a simile, but it's also the simile it's making is that the fire is out of control. It's trying to consume everything, um, and the fire is being personified as well. So it's both a simile and a personification. And this is important because, and before now, everyone was saying that the only way to be rescued is a signal fire. But ironically. This is not a signal signal fire, it's not a controlled fire, it's not a careful fire, it's a complete out of control fire because they're trying to burn out Ralph. They know he's hiding in a bush and they're trying to set fire to all of the forest, all of the jungle rather, until they find that he, where he is. So it's the very opposite of a controlled organized rescue fire, it's out of control and it's very dangerous. And then uh, the officer says, who's boss here? I am, said Ralph loudly, so he's finally, leadership has been regained, his place in the world is sort of reassured, civilization has returned, all of that sort of stuff, he feels like everything is as it should be, he's been given a new role of, you know, leadership. Now, last little page here, I've got a colonialist reading there, um, you could, if you want, just sketch a little headdress uh, to represent kind of this, the very opposite of the cap that was worn by the officer, they sort of face to face, but I mean you can't see that, face to face, the headdress versus kind of the sailor's hat. Then we've got, I should have thought, said the officer as he visualized the search before him, I should have thought that a pack of British boys, you're all British aren't you, would have been able to put up a better show than that. I mean, so that's also draw a little Union Jack, which I'm going to struggle to do, but basically Britishness is being reasserted and re sort of instated or put back in place. Uh, then he said, I know, jolly good show, like the Coral Island, which is an intertextual reference, and that's significant because in Coral Island, if, if my memory serves me, uh, nothing bad happened, so it's quite ironic because what has actually happened is, you know, akin to the body death count of Romeo and Juliet rather than, you know, the light-hearted fun of Coral Island. And then the tears began to flow and sobs shook him. So sort of he has returned back to his innocent form. His sort of Bildung's, Bildung's Roman has returned backwards. He was, you know, growing up and becoming a man, and now he's the opposite. Uh, and that's the end of the story. Q.
Cool.